Hi, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Dr. Tony Farrell, the chair for the Department of Education and Liberal Arts here at Ashford University. The faculty and staff of the Department of Education and Liberal Arts welcome you to session three of our eight part webinar series, The Dog Ate My Mask, Schooling and Parenting During a Pandemic. Today's session is titled, This is the Way We Learn from Home, Learn from Home, Learn from Home, Supporting Elementary Students with Online Learning. Today, we will focus on our younger learners. We received a ton of feedback from previous sessions regarding the need for strategies and ideas for the pre-kindergartner through elementary age student. These students have a variety of needs from both an educational and social emotional perspective. I believe that after today's session, you'll be able to take numerous strategies and apply them within the online learning environment immediately. Today, we have a great group of presenters. These pre uh, presenters have tremendous experience in both traditional and online educational environments. They are excited to share recommendations and strategies to support our younger students. So at this time, I'd like the presenters to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Lauren and I'm an associate professor in the Early Childhood Education Program. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Frank Guevara, assistant professor in the Early Childhood Associate Degree Program. Hi, my name is Dr. Stephanie Healds, and I am an assistant professor in the Bachelor of Arts in Early Childhood Educational Leadership Program. Hi, I'm Amy Johnson. I'm an associate professor in the Early Childhood Education Program. Welcome to the session. I'm Denise Maxwell, lead faculty for the Masters of Art in Education. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Tisha Shipley and a professor in the Early Childhood Education Department. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Michelle Simisek. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Education, Bachelor of Arts Early Education Program. Hi everyone, I'm Jen Zauer and I'm an assistant professor in the Early Childhood Development and Child Development Programs. Thanks team. A few reminders before we start today's webinar. First, the chat will be open during the webinar. If you have any questions, Dr. Maxwell will respond in the chat or bring them forward at the end of the session. Also, at the end of the webinar, there will be time for any additional questions as well. Finally, there will be a survey sent to you at the end of today's webinar. Please take the time to complete the survey. We use the feedback and information from the survey to make this uh, uh, webinar series the most useful uh, information possible to support you as parents. With that, I will turn the presentation over to Frank. Thank you, Tony. So many of us have fond memories of getting ready to go back to school. Picking out a new lunchbox, filling your backpack with school supplies, or taking the annual first day of school picture at the front door. But this school year is radically different. When COVID hit last spring and schools hit pause, most of us were willing to suffer through those last few weeks of the school year with take home packets and the occasional Zoom session. We put up with those small inconveniences, hoping that by the fall, this pandemic would be ancient history. And as summer came to a close, we all looked ahead with anticipation and nostalgia for what that first day of school would bring. Now I can tell you that the first day of school for my family was a disaster. First, school was moved fully online, and then the first day of school was pushed back a whole week. So we waited for our school to send us information about the format for the new first day of school. Finally, the night before, we received an email explaining the schedule for tomorrow. So with seven children in attendance, we hooked up our laptop to the TV in the family room and logged in a few minutes before the meeting and then waited and waited. Eventually, we were led into the all school assembly, but that meeting ran long. So each subsequent breakout session ran later and later into the afternoon. And when the social studies teacher tried to walk us through the learning platform, the chat box blew up with countless technical problems people were having just getting logged in. 
Needless to say, after over three hours of continuous Zoom meetings and lots of frustration, neither my children nor I were looking forward to the school year. But I share my story not to say we should just throw up our hands in defeat. Rather, throughout our webinar, we aim to share the hope found in the words of Mark Twain, who said, I have never let my schooling interfere with my education. I promise you that technology will get in the way. I'm confident the schedule may interfere with your daily life. And it's likely there will be days where you or your child will just want to quit. But a key message for you today is that so much of your children's learning will happen when they're unplugged rather than sitting in front of a screen. Thinking about our youngest learners, pre-K and kinder, it's also important to reflect on the uniqueness of this stage of development. There's a reason that children of this age are often referred to as little scientists, because they're naturally curious about the world and want to learn about it. It's that sense of wonder which makes this age magical. And we know that children learn by actively doing. As Bev Boss said, if it hasn't been in the hand and body, it can't be in the brain. So our strategies today focus on how school concepts can be reinforced through daily hands-on activities, like comparing how many rainbow marshmallows there are in your child's cereal versus the number of purple horseshoes, or when you're folding the laundry by having children make a simple sequence like blue sock, green sock, blue sock. And while these fun learning activities will help to keep them motivated, it's important to remember that our youngest scholars are also learning how to manage their big emotions. So you should be prepared to have a meltdown or two as children get frustrated. We should also expect some children to struggle with the fear of disappointing their teachers. So you might find yourself saying, it's okay if you don't finish that worksheet, only to have your child respond with, but I need to. The best piece of advice we can share comes from author L. R. Nost, who said, when our little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it is our job to share your calm, not join their chaos. Now that we've talked about the big ideas, Tisha will share some specific strategies for putting this into practice for pre-K and kinder students. Thank you so much, Frank. So as you begin to learn and work from home, you have to decide what you want your school and workday to look like. So this starts with how you need to set up your environment. The environment will look different for all families and all different in ages and stages of children, but the concepts are the same. When we talk about your environment and your day, you have to do what works best for your family. Is this going to take place in the living room, in the office, or in the kitchen, what type of space will you be in? The child will need a space that they know is theirs, that they will be working at each day. That doesn't mean that they can't sit on the floor or sit at the kitchen table, but a space that they can retreat to to do their learning. This is a space that needs to be free of clutter, but include all the supplies they will need to be successful. And this will look different for each child. Children thrive on routine, and knowing what they will be doing and when. For this reason, it's a great idea to sit down and make a visual schedule with them. This can be accomplished through pictures and even words when appropriate if your child can read. You can also make a visual schedule for yourself so that your child knows exactly what you will be doing during a certain time of the day. Also, make sure that you set time aside for play and to practice new skills together each day. It's backed in research that children learn best through hands-on and learning. And that means play. An easy way to remember how long a child should be expected to have attention is often their age and sometimes double their age. So if a child is four years old, they have the attention span of about four minutes. But as we know, it's often longer depending on what they're engaged in, 
their maturity level, and many other possibilities. So if at all possible, the child should be learning through exploration. This doesn't mean that there won't be computer work from their teacher, but we should have children as engaged in their learning as possible. And this is often accomplished with the young child through just allowing them to play when time permits. Make time for the child to alternate what they're doing. So standing, sitting, moving, being on the computer, taking a dance break, singing their favorite song, free play, going outside, riding their bike, taking a walk, even giving them some sidewalk chalk to write with. We have to remember that play is how children learn. And by building in that natural play time, we are allowing them to discover and connect information that they're learning. Just some other things that are important are telling stories, saying nursery rhymes, talking when you're riding in the car or at the grocery store, because this allows children to practice skills, learn new vocabulary, and use their imagination. As you begin working from home, Set your goals with your child. Write the goals out on a huge piece of paper. What are the expectations that both of you have? For example, one expectation could be to start each day at 9 a.m. Another could be if you're in a meeting that your child grabs an activity off the table that you have laid out for them. These can be things such as Play-Doh, whiteboards, crayons, markers, a puzzle, a book, or even a toy from their bedroom. You can also do a first and then, and you see this on the slide. First, you need to work on this, and then you can do this activity. As you can see, there are pictures drawn on this so that if your child can't read, they still know what they need to do. And as we know, it's a lot easier to follow expectation and goals that are set by yourself than by someone else. So for this reason, write those goals and expectations together and hang those goals up on the wall where you will be working. We need to talk about rewards next because they are important. They can be simple things such as stickers, notes of words, words of praise, roll on glitter, spray on glitter for their hand, and a jar with pennies. And after you collect so many pennies, you get to have an ice cream party or a pizza party. The reward can be something that your child and you agree on and that are set in your goals and expectations. There are going to be times that you as the parent need to be working or you might be doing something else such as being in a meeting or cooking dinner and the child needs to be busy. Simple things that you can have your child do are play with Play-Doh, markers, crayons, coloring books, whiteboards, scissors, paper to cut with. You can also get really creative and give them a bowl with water and a sponge or a paintbrush and have them go out on the back porch where you have cement and draw with the water or Practice writing numbers, letters, shapes, whatever you're working on, and it will dry very quickly in this heat. Another activity is to spray shaving cream on a table or a cookie sheet, or again, even on the back porch, and let them practice their sight words, their letters, their numbers, or just draw. Also, if you didn't know yet, there are many websites out there that have authors reading the books that they've written, and your child can find their favorite book and listen to the author read that to them. Also think about getting together a letter, color, number, shape, scavenger hunt within your house or your neighborhood. Honestly, I want you to remember that the most important thing is today is today and you are never going to get that day back. So just play with them, practice folding laundry, cook with your child, teach them to make themselves a sandwich, write a letter to their grandparent, let them dry dishes, Help them make their bed and organize their toys. Sit down and watch a movie if you need some downtime. Spending time with your child is the most important thing you will do, and you are teaching and modeling for them every single day. So continue to be their parent, have fun, and know that you are doing great. Now we are going to move on to Jen, and she is going to share ideas for first through third grade. Thanks so much, Tisha. So, Remember back when we used to be able to have play dates with our kids? And during those play dates, did you ever wonder, gosh, why can that child sit and play for a long period of time, but others would lose interest in just a few minutes? Well, this all has to do with attention spans. A six-year-old can keep attention for about 20 minutes, a seven-year-old 25 minutes, and an eight-year-old about 30 minutes. So it's really important that you can identify how long your child can focus so that you can structure your day with chunks of time that align with their needs. And if you're not really sure 
how long your child's attention span is, take out a book and read with them. When you see them start to fidget or squirm, wiggle or get up and walk away, note how long it took. That's a really good indicator of their attention span and a good place to start when you're creating blocks of time in your daily schedule. And while we're thinking about attention spans, we know that one of the biggest challenges of remote learning has to do with the technology. And this might be more true for us as parents than even with our kids. But while young kids are proficient with technology, doing things like FaceTiming or playing video games, using technology to learn is an entirely different ball game. So my youngest is six and she's in first grade. And we've really had to learn some tricks to help make navigating and using technology manageable so that she can be independent while she's trying to work. And one thing that we found that was really helpful is using highlighter tape to mark keys on the keyboard. And don't worry, I'll share a link on our resource page on how you can find that. But I used one color to mark the letter in my daughter's name and a different color that marked important keys like the enter key, the shift key, or the period key. And this helped my daughter to be able to learn how to log in and not hunt for where all those letters were. And even a bigger benefit than that was that it boosted her confidence and really let her be in charge of her learning. Another huge help was making shortcuts on the desktop of frequently used sites. And this way, once my daughter was able to log in, then she just had to find the picture on the desktop to click on it. Another thing that you might be thinking if you, you, know, you have young children from first to third grade or maybe even a kinder or older is that typing is hard for kids this age. And not to mention that when you have young children, a lot of them are still learning how to spell and they can't think about what's the next sound I hear in this word when they're trying to search for the letters on the keyboard. So what I have found to be really helpful is to give them a piece of paper or a whiteboard and let them write down their ideas and then transfer them to the computer. And depending on your child or maybe how their day is going, they might be able to type it or maybe you type it in or you can always check with your child's teacher as well to see if you can just send a picture of their work. And another thing that has been a game changer at my house for remote learning has been teaching my children how to contact their teachers using the systems the school has in place. So you can teach them to use email or messaging, however the school has it set up. But before you use it for getting help, have your kids send a fun message such as what's your favorite color or do you have any pets? because many kids get anxious when they think about asking for help. So if they've used the system in a less stressful way, they'll be more confident. And finally, it's natural for our kids to ask us for help when they get stuck. But in the classroom, a lot of teachers use a strategy called ask three before me to try to encourage kids to ask for, you know, figure something out before they're asking for help. And you can do this at home too come up with a list of ways they can ask for help. And then this way, if you're at work or you're in a work meeting or maybe you're helping younger siblings, they have some things to try until you're able to provide help to them. Sometimes we have to step away from the technology to learn and Michelle is going to share some ideas about that. Thanks, Jen. Throughout my years working as a reading specialist in schools, the number one question I always got was, what can I do to help my child become a better reader? My answer was simple and never wavered. Read with your child. So our goal for children at this age is that they find the joy in reading. But how do we make that happen? Well, two words, interest and choice. Just remember that your child has to have a say in his or her book. Reluctant readers will be even less likely to read about something that they're not interested in. Keep a handful of books that your child can easily read on their own in a bin, a bag, or a basket near their learning station. And when they need to take a break from the online work and unplug, you can set a timer for five or 10 minutes and have your child sit quietly reading those books on their own. As days pass, you can make that timer go longer as that attention span increases. I also suggest having a couple books set aside that might be a little more difficult for your child. These are ones they can't quite read on their own. Now, when you have five or 10 minutes in your schedule, you can read these books with them. One way to do this is simply read the book out loud so your child can enjoy the story without having to worry about sounding out words or losing meaning. 
or you could try what we call paired reading. In paired reading, you read together in unison. Your child signals to you when they might like to read alone. And when they read, if they struggle with the word or they pause for an extra beat, you simply jump in and continue reading with them. You don't take time to break down the word or help them sound it out. You just jump in and save them in their struggle and keep reading together until your child signals they are ready again to read on their own. This strategy is a great one to take that frustration out of reading a harder text for your child. Another great way to get your child reading without the need for your attention is to set them up with some of those recorded books that Tisha talked about earlier. On our resource page, I added a Google Doc which houses hundreds of live links to stories read aloud for children. And finally, think about setting your child up on FaceTime or Zoom with grandma, grandpa, aunts or uncles or cousins and have them read a story there. You'll be surprised how much your child will practice reading if they think they might have an opportunity to show off those skills to someone they care about. We also want to remember children at this age are still developing their lifetime handwriting skills. So we do want them holding a pencil and writing as much as possible when they're not logged into that computer. And they love authentic reasons to write. So if your child is home, likely they're not seeing their friends and family members very often. So this is a great time to bring back pen pals or good old fashioned snail mail. I mean, who doesn't love to get a letter in the mail? The kids love it and they'll be eager to help you bring the mail in, which you can use as a movement break, and it gives them a fun reason to write. Writing thank you cards is another great way to get them writing. Anytime they receive a gift, have them write a thank you card before they can play or use the gift. It's excellent motivation. And when they're very young, they might just start out by drawing a picture and writing their name. As they get older, they begin adding words, and eventually they'll be able to write their own cards and letters. It doesn't need to look perfect. Remember, these are just opportunities to practice. And finally, what about having your child help you with your grocery list? Have your child keep a running grocery list somewhere in sight. And when you need to add to it, just say, hey, we ran out of apples. Could you go add apples to the shopping list? Finding fun ways to get our kids writing gives them practice with a purpose. When we consider math and numeracy, we also want to think of fun ways to get them offline and unplugged. Telling time is something so many of our elementary students struggle with in school, but think about it. Think about those clocks you have in your home. I would imagine most, if not all, are digital, and children need to learn how to tell time on a traditional face clock. If you do not have one at home, try to find an old watch with a clock face and keep it out in handy for your child to practice with. Counting money is another important skill at this age, so it's great to keep a bag of coins handy for them to practice counting with. Once they become comfortable counting money quickly, they can practice making change for pretend purchases, or you could go a step further and allow them to pick out something small like gum or a drink at the store, ask them to think about what coins they need to pay for it, and then have them practice checking out. Think about also having resources for math on hand ahead of time. If the teacher did not provide this for you, you can create a small kit at home. Spending a little bit of time putting that together beforehand will help your child work through math more independently down the road. Some typical things to include in a kit would be some counters, and that can be anything small they can move and count, like noodles, beans, cubes, some blank paper, try to use unlined so that they can draw out their math problems, a whiteboard with markers, and it's a great idea to include a number line or a hundreds chart for reference. Again, in our resources page, you'll find a link that will give you some free math manipulatives. Also, students at this age, we want to think about their emotional stability. They need to feel safe and emotional, emotionally stable for maximum learning. Online learning can be stressful. It's harder for them to connect with their teachers, and they may struggle more than they let on. So the best thing parents can do is be supportive and understanding. If your child is becoming stressed out by something required of them, encourage them to step away. Sometimes taking a break is the best answer and their teacher would certainly agree. Try to develop a relationship with their teacher and reach out when you notice that your child is becoming frustrated so that they can step in and help. 
Also, FaceTiming with their teacher is also helpful for your child to build that relationship and it makes their learning time more effective. So if your child's teacher offers one-on-one -on -one sessions, encourage your child to sign up. We also want to think about ways to help our child, child reduce stress because stress relief at this age is important and it looks different in every kid. Some examples that might help are to get your child outside and activities, movement breaks, crafts, or playing a game. Many children are feeling lonely right now. They miss their friends and they also just miss being around other kids and activity at school. So it's great to look for ways to connect them online with friends and family. They can get together on FaceTime or Zoom. <clears throat> they can build Legos, make friendship bracelets, play Battleship, all together but distanced through a screen. And if you watched last week's webinar, you saw that Jen's daughter and her friend figured out a way to play Uno over FaceTime. So don't forget to reach out to your child's teacher, the school psychologist, social worker, or maybe even a coach if you see your child struggling emotionally. The school has resources for you to use and people who want to help your children be successful. Now Jen's going to come back on to talk a bit more about motivation and goals. Jen? Thanks, Michelle. So whether it's with technology or an unplugged activity, we know some kids just lack the motivation to hop on the computer or complete whatever needs to get done that day. With my four kids, I have one who cannot wait to get started and one who would use every last nickel in their piggy bank to have someone else do their work for them. Creating a goal chart can be a powerful tool to help motivate your child. You can set it up by the day or by the week, depending on how much motivation your child needs to stay on task and complete their work. One thing that I have learned is that it's important to look for patterns or of successes or struggles. So for example, you might notice that your child's biggest struggle is not that they don't do their work, but rather they have trouble logging into class on time. So you can create a tool to track and monitor progress in this area. Another example might be if your child comes to you at the same time each day, then there's a pattern of when they're needing help. So make a goal around that. Keep in mind though, that the challenges and struggles might and are likely to change over time. So don't get frustrated when what was working suddenly isn't. It's kind of like, you know, one week your kid loves Cheerios for breakfast and the next week they don't. So if you're looking for more detailed information about motivation, our webinar from last week has a ton of ideas and we'll share the link for that at the end. And something else that we've discovered, especially in our house, is that sometimes the struggle with getting work done is just that it seems like too much. So a trick that I used in my classroom and used with my own kids is to fold the paper in half or give them some sticky notes and let them cover up sections of the paper. And then they just pull one sticky note off at a time and just have to work on that section or problem. And it works really well too if your school's assigning digital worksheets because you can just stick that note right on the computer screen and then they can pull it off. And when we think about what we talked about at the beginning regarding attention spans, we know that kids can't sit for a long time and they need to move. Not only does this help with their attention and focus, but according to the CDC, kids at this age need about 30 minutes of cardio per day. So building in cardio breaks is a great way to break up your day and allow your child to be able to focus better when it's learning time. These can be things like taking the dog for a walk, going for a quick, quick bike ride, playing soccer in the backyard, just make sure you set a timer so that kids know when that break time is over. And we also can find ways to practice our fine motor skills during our day. Michelle talked about the importance of writing to support development in this area, but don't forget about things like origami, Legos, puzzles, making bracelets and board games. When kids are taking a much needed break from the screen and, learn, and doing you know, traditional learning at this time, they're still learning with these activities. Puzzles help with thinking and problem solving, Legos are engineering, origami requires following directions and using those tiny little muscles in your fingers to fold paper. These activities will help your child to refocus, which will also help you keep your sanity during these busy times at home. We're gonna switch things over now to Lauren so she can share some ideas for fourth and fifth graders. Thank you, Jen. Sometimes it can be hard to focus as a child the average time an eight-year-old can focus is between 16 to 24 minutes, and a 10-year-old can focus between 20 to 30 minutes. Now, this is only an average, 
every child is different. So if you have a nine year old who can only focus for 20 minutes at a time, don't worry about it. It's quite normal. And thinking about a child's attention span, we must consider the amount of time he or she is spending completing a learning task. Learning segments or tasks should be around 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the child's age. Once your child has completed a learning task, he or she might need a few minutes to step away from the schoolwork to take a break or what teachers might call a brain break. Some ideas for brain breaks might include having your child sit on a yoga ball for five minutes and just move and bounce around. Dancing. There are tons of dance videos that children can access on YouTube. My children just love to dance to the freeze dance song whenever they need a break. Shoot baskets using an indoor basketball hoop that you can hang on the back of a door. Or have them walk around the block, play fetch with a dog, or play ball with a parent or sibling. You might even think about creating a brain break jar with ideas for different types of breaks for your child. All you need is a jar or some type of container, popsicle sticks, paper, sticky notes, something to write break ideas on. Sit down with your child and talk about different ideas he or she might have about the types of breaks they want to take. Then all your child has to do is pull one of those break ideas out of the brain break jar and then they have an idea for a break. Now let's learn about navigating technology needs with Amy. I fully understand the need for children to be able to navigate technology on their own as much as possible. And by this age, that's much more realistic. Fourth and fifth graders have turned into more independent workers and you can assist them without micromanaging. To help without hovering, build a cheat sheet like you see on the slide. First, write down key pieces of information like the passwords they use to get into their learning platforms and provide troubleshooting ideas if a password isn't working. Show them how the caps lock works on the keyboard because if that's on, it will alter the lowercase letters in their password. Remind them to type slowly and try again if the password doesn't work the first time. Then show them important items on Zoom or other video devices. For instance, show them how to pin a video so they can have the teacher's face large on the screen. Show them how they can tell if a camera is on. My friend's child logged on to Zoom early one day and for some unknown reason, while waiting for class to start, he decided to bicep curl his three pound barbells to build his tiny 10 year old muscles. Unbeknownst to him, the camera was on and his classmates caught the entire performance. He now checks that the camera is off before beginning each workout regime. They're now old enough to ask the teacher for help if they don't understand an assignment or learning concept. So show them where they can access assignment feedback and ways in which they can contact the teacher. On that cheat sheet, provide a schedule for additional help throughout the day. You may have meetings or work commitments at certain times, so tell them where to go when you're not free. Is there a friend or relative who's offered to help? We'll take them up on that offer. For instance, my niece FaceTimes her grandparents. They help her with small questions during the day, and because they live in another state, they love the opportunity to spend more time with her and she has another means of support. Many libraries have free homework assistance. Test it out with your child. If it's something that's beneficial, list that as a resource. My local library has online tutoring and homework support starting at 2 p.m., so I put that on the schedule. When you put the information in one place, your child has instructions for logging onto learning platforms, ways to contact the teacher, and ways to receive additional help throughout the day. Poet and author Emily Buckwald said, children are made readers on the laps of their parents. And as a pre previous fifth grade teacher, I can tell you that families who read together are invaluable to learning. Most children in grades four to five are practicing several foundational literacy skills in their e-learning programs already. And the best support for this is real reading and writing practice. Many children have had exposure to reading and writing centers in their classroom, and they can manage these independently in a recreated home model. 
These reading and writing centers can be cozy spaces in their room or somewhere else in your home, have different types of reading and writing materials, and even books on tapered tablets. The picture on the bottom center shows a reading corner in my son's room with books, magazines, headsets, photo albums, fiction and nonfiction, a flashlight for night reading, and even a space for me. I leave a book in there so that he can see that I value reading as an adult. And quite honestly, sometimes I really look forward to that time for my own break. There are other times that I sit in the space with my son and we read books together. During the time you read with your child, you can elaborate on a word that they don't know or use a synonym for a word within the book. You may stop and talk about elements of comprehension, check for understanding, or ask further open-ended questions to prompt further dialogue. You can help your child to decode new words, sequence story elements, expand vocabulary, and cover story elements. You can model fluency and help them gain the notion of reading to learn. All of these are important developmental elements in making children better readers. There's really no right or wrong plan for this space. There's really no scaffolded plan, but do remember the most important lesson is to be a role model and support their learning and their love of reading. A final idea for this literacy corner is to add a small piece of curved PVC pipe to it. You can often get these for a few dollars at your local hardware store and children can practice reading into this piece of pipe and it echoes in their ear and gives them a model of automaticity and accuracy to use independently. You can also put a timer in there for them to time their reading which promotes fluency. And then there's writing. Remember, this age includes an increase in the need for independence and ownership. So allow your child to create this space. My son chose to put several instruments in there to write with, such as markers. He put chalk in there and colored pens, pencils, and different writing materials and mediums for different purposes. He chose a whiteboard to write his daily workout, fancy paper index cards and memos to write notes with family members out of state, he put post-its in there to leave around the house with reminders and a composition book that him and I used to journal back and forth to each other about this unique year. I also added a prop box. He places items in the prop box to write about. And it's an area that he's motivated to use because it's interest-based and he had the major part in creating it. Literacy is lifelong and helping to develop a love of literacy through supportive real reading and writing is the best kind of support you can give your child in grades four to five. Numeracy is another area in your child's curriculum where the best support is just those real and relevant experiences. I have to start by telling you that deep down, I hate math. Um, from my early memories of math worksheets to workbooks to timed worksheets to hearing today from my very confident nine-year-old how to properly add two plus two the new way, as a mom, I really needed to figure out a way that I could be a positive role model for my child who actually loves math. I can remember cooking with my grandmother in the kitchen, using detailed recipes to make the most fantastic Christmas cookies. I can remember shopping with my mom and trying to figure out 30% off sales. And I can remember my dad asking me to go get a hexagon head tool, which I now know is the Allen wrench. Believe it or not, these are all connected to elements of numeracy at this developmental level. You can include experiences deliberately designed to extend a concept, such as fractions in cooking, watching for geometric figures and patterns on bike rides, estimating travel times, charting allowance, budgeting birthday money, and measuring things around the house. When you're at the grocery store with your child, ask if one banana for 19 cents is a better deal than a bunch of four for a dollar. I actually had the opportunity last year to supplement my youngest son's learning while he was completing an at-home learning curriculum. And in his end of the year reflection, he didn't mention anything about the skills, the content, or the concepts. He mentioned the moments of learning that will always be memorable. Squeezing an egg as hard as he could to see how a spherical object won't break with equal pressure. Making ice cream in a baggie successfully. But the epic fail of making homemade bread horribly because we use tablespoons instead of teaspoons of salt. He remembers basic addition and subtraction with chalk on the pavers, Legos as base 10 blocks. He remembers Yahtzee Fridays for addition practice. He remembers tracking the puppy's height and weight throughout the year, sorting change in my car, finding the best deal on a bike, skip counting the school days left, timing his sprints around the block and counting his heart rate after, then making it into an entire graph throughout the year so that he could see its progress. He remembers making a TikTok rap on geometric shape names. And one more you might relate to. 
He remembers and reminds me about a time that I was 17 miles over in a speed zone. Numeracy and literacy in grades four to five are times when children are beginning to understand that these concepts are going to be part of their daily lives going forward. One of the most important things you can do to support their learning is just use these real life experiences and realize no matter how you add two plus two, you're gonna get four in the end. Lauren is now gonna share some ideas on how to support your child with social emotional strategies. Thank you, Stephanie. Just like you and I, children experience stress and frustration, yet they do not necessarily know how to appropriately handle these emotions. So for example, the other day, my nine-year-old son was trying to log into his spelling course and he could not remember his password. I could see after several attempts that he was getting frustrated. Next would be a possible meltdown and most likely a delay in getting his spell assignment completed. At that point, my son needed a way to calm himself down so he could be more successful during that learning time. Some strategies to help children calm down during a stressful situation might include engaging your child in positive self-talk. Have him or her practice saying, I can be successful in logging into my spelling course, or I can read this chapter in one day. Have them paint, color, or draw. There are many free coloring pages available online that you can print off and have in a folder for your child if he or she needs a coloring cool down break. Your child can imagine her favorite place to sit or visit, such as the beach, favorite reading spot, a place with his family on vacation. Kid yoga is a good way to get children up and moving when they need that break. There are many yoga videos on YouTube that children can watch, and my three boys absolutely love taking a calm down break to do yoga with Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog, as you can see on the far right picture. There are also breathing exercises that children can learn, and this is called shape breathing. These um, can be accessed through online if you just Google shape breathing and it, it helps them learn different types of patterns. So let's talk about motivation now. Motivation is the drive behind what we do. It's the force behind staying up late to make that science project even better than what it was. It can also lead kids to continue to try after failure some ideas you might try to motivate your child might include praising your child's successes, but you want to make sure and be specific with your child so they are aware of the positive behavior. So instead of saying, good job, you might say, thank you for cleaning up your desk. Instead of saying, way to go, buddy, you might say, you really put some effort into that spelling assignment. I'm proud of you. You might find a special place to display their schoolwork. This might be near their work area, the refrigerator, the wall, a window, anywhere that the child can see it. Find special activities that motivate your children to learn. My children love playing Fortnite, so every school day they have the opportunity to earn five minutes of Fortnite, Fortnite playtime per assignment completed with quality per day. You might implement a reward system based on your child's interests. So Fortnite time, reading time, FaceTiming a friend. I previously worked with a child who absolutely loved to watch fireworks shows. He had a reward system in which he earned two minutes to watch fireworks videos on YouTube each time he completed an assignment. Some goals you might set to motivate your child might include completing a certain assignment, or completing a certain amount of assignments by the end of the school day, accessing all posted content from their class, or keeping their workspace organized and ready for the next day. Incorporating movement into incentives for children can also be very beneficial. Let's move on to Amy, who's going to speak on motor skills. Like with the other ages, both fine and gross motor movement is important for fourth and fifth graders. Movement can be incorporated into the learning, especially for kinesthetic learners. It's easier to retain information when the body is involved in the learning. So have your child jump on a trampoline while practicing math facts. During spelling, call out a word and have your child spell it while bouncing a ball one letter per bounce. Let them draw their letters or numbers with sidewalk chalk. Movement should also be incorporated as learning breaks. 
On this slide, you see fine motor skills through rainbow loom and sisters tracing each other with sidewalk chalk and gross motor skills in an old fashioned game of Twister. Use items around the house and improvise activities that your child wouldn't normally do. For instance, have your child take your junk mail, open the envelopes and crumple up the paper inside. He can then throw the wadded sheets across the room where a sibling opens the sheets and puts them into the shredder or tears them up over the trash can. Ask your child to come up with ideas for incorporating learning and movement. They likely have some clever suggestions. Swap those ideas with your friends to increase the number of tools in your toolkit. So we know that remote learning is probably one of the biggest balancing acts that we are ever going to face as parents. Every day we are constantly questioning whether we're doing the right thing, how long is this going to last, and whether or not we can handle it. Rest assured you can. As I've been navigating this for the last five weeks with my four kids while my husband teaches elementary band in the background, we've learned a few things that have helped us to balance all that's happening. First, make a plan for your day. Write down the things that absolutely need to happen and the things that would be nice to get done. Only worry about getting through the half twos for that day. Create family expectations. When everyone is on the same page, it, can, it helps. It can be simple like, you know, when my door is open, you can come in and when the door is shut, you need to try to solve your own problem. Take breaks with your family. We as parents need to get up and move just as much as our kids. And when we do this together, everyone can connect, refresh and recharge. And don't forget to look for the learning that is happening all around you. Just like we learned with the suggestions today, it might look like they're just playing with Legos, but there is so much more happening. And finally, remember that your teachers know this is hard and challenging. It's a first for them too. They don't expect it to all be perfect and go smoothly every day. So give yourself some grace, take a deep breath when you need to, and know that while this might feel like an eternity, it really is only temporary and teachers know everyone is doing their very best each and every day. And as we've shared in the chat, we have our open source resource page that's available to share with ideas we've talked about today. And the link is here on the screen. So, you know, jot it down so that you can go in there and find the resources. We're constantly adding new ideas and new information and resources with each section. So if you don't find something you need there, there's also a place on that page to request additional resources to be added. And feel free to share this resource in local places or with other parents that you know are going through this or with your school. Um, back to you, Tony. Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> so uh, a couple of key takeaways from today. Create a plan. There are learning opportunities all around you. Kids need to move and embrace the challenge and opportunities to grow. So that being said, uh, now's our time for uh, any questions that you may have. Dr. Maxwell, are there any questions in the chat that can be directed to our panelists? We have a few. Several people have asked about a certificate for attendance and we will be emailing those to the people who share their emails with us, but also for anyone else, you can go to the resource page and we will provide a link there if you give us just a couple days to get it in there and you can download a certificate for participation at this session. I do have some questions. I'm gonna to go to Michelle first for our presenters. Michelle, you had some great ideas about literature. How does a parent find literature that connects with the child's interests and choice? Well, I think that just comes from knowing your kid. If your kid is passionate about soccer, um, try to find something related to soccer or sports. If you've got a child that's passionate about dinosaurs, don't give them a book about ballet. And sometimes parents are trying to reach for whatever they've got on hand. I shared a Google Doc. If you, you go to the open resources that we're going to share with the link, and go to the elementary and ECE resources, there is a link there for um, a live library and there are literally hundreds of books there for children that are all ready to go for you. And it's, you can go by subject and interest level there. So that would be a great place for parents. 
That is a great resource that you posted there. Thanks for doing that, Michelle. Jen, you shared a great suggestion for getting help, the concept of Ask Three Before Me. How do children do this in a home environment? Uh, definitely. So I think there's a lot of things you can do. If you have, so my house, we have four kids, right? I have an eighth grader, fifth third and first grader. So it could be something such as, you know, ask an older sibling if there's something that you need. Um, if you happen to have more than one parent working at home, it could be, you know, ask a parent who's not in the meeting. It could be something like send a message to your teacher through the system. And, you know, most of the different learning management systems that schools are using for remote learning have a way for students to message their teachers. So it could be something like send a message. Um, something that I know my fifth and eighth grader are doing a lot as far as asking someone is they have friends that are in their classes. And so it might be, you know, ask a friend, call up a friend and say, I'm having trouble on this math page, you know, could you help me? And it gives them some of that social interaction too. Something else that we do um, is I have a place, if you came to the session last week about motivation, we talked about a Kanban board and where my kids move, you know, their work from a to do to doing to done. And then we have an there, you can put an extra column on the end of that, kind of like a parking lot where they can stick questions. So even if they, can't, you know, it's still a third place they can go, right? Even if they're not getting it answered immediately, they can write it down and stick it on there. And then when you have time, you can help them with it. So those are some ideas that I have when you're at home or even grandparents too, right? Call up grandma, grandpa. Hey, they might say, I've never seen this math before, but you know, call them up and they're a great resource too. All excellent ideas. I do think that uh, capturing their question in the moment on a sticky note and setting it off to the side can help them remember because lots of times they have a tendency to forget what the question was by the time you're available to help them. So love the helpline idea. Frank, you talked about share your calm with your child through breathing and it's such a great strategy. Do you have other recommendations for how to demonstrate your calm with your child even when you're not feeling calm? Thanks, Denise. Yes, there's a, a wonderful strategy called the 3-3 three, three rule. First, look around, name three things that you see, then name three sounds you hear, and finally move three parts of your body, maybe your ankle, your fingers, or your arm. It's a structured way to center your mind and kind of unstick, unstick yourself from the stress that's going on. Um, for children of all ages, uh, but I think especially for our youngest ones, finding something that will make them laugh. For me and my children, it's America's Funniest Home Videos when people are having mishaps, like slipping on the ice. Just anything that will turn that frown upside down, I think is a good way to share that calm um, in the moment. Cat videos can be really good for humor also. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> great idea. Lauren, you provided some great examples of how to take brain breaks for the learner. And I think this might be something that parents uh, sometimes struggle with. What ideas do you have on how to re-engage the child or the learner back into the task from the brain break? Great question, Denise. So this is what teachers call um, transitions. And teachers usually um, have children do some type of activity as they're transitioning from one learning activity to another. This might look like something like a cleanup song. And the home parents can do this as well. So for younger children, they might have them sing their favorite song as they walk back to their learning area. Or they might have them walk like a, their favorite animal. For older um, children, they might have them do a sing a chant or say a chant or even a special high five as they walk back with their parent to their learning area. If you Google um, transition activities um, in early childhood and elementary, there are tons of examples that parents can use. Thanks. That is a great suggestion. Transitions can be challenging. Um, Amy, I really like the way that you included how to use grandparents or extended family members in the learning process. What additional suggestions do you have for developing more independence in the learner so they can be successful without your direct guidance or support? Okay, um, 
if you give them a language to use when asking for help, so for instance, um, if they're stuck, stuck on a math problem and they uh, message their teacher, I don't understand the assignment. And the teacher messages back, which assignment? My math. What problem? Problem four. And it can go back and forth forever and ever until the child just shuts the computer off and gives up. So if you ha even have it written out, um, dear teacher, I don't understand problem number blank on my blank worksheet. I have tried this. Can you please help? And so that would speed up infinitely uh, the help process. Um, another way is to kind of um, promote independence in the home. Uh, for instance, my girls need to empty the dishwasher each night, um, but it's, I ask them to when I'm ready to load it. So it's always on my timetable. Girls come empty the dishwasher and it interrupts their schedule, which I, you know, I didn't care about at first because I need it emptied. But then I decided, you know what, let them do it on their timetable as long as it's done before 7 p.m. So they know every morning the dishes are clean. I need them done by 7 p.m. So it kind of gives them an independence to do the chore on their time and it still meets my expectation. Great ideas, Amy, especially the part of having them indicate what they've already tried. So it indicates that they're part of the solution also. Stephanie, you provided some great examples for developing a literacy corner in each person's home. How do you prevent the child from becoming bored with the materials that you put in the literacy corner or the learning centers? Yeah, great question. I think, again, you really want to have um, let the child have ownership of that area. And one of the best things I found is the book exchange, um, whether it be one of his athletic teams or, again, something coming back and forth for, from school, um, but especially when it is something based on interest. So if my son trades a lot of books with his basketball friends, and these books can stay in the home as long as they need them, but it's also a, a motivator because they're coming from someone that is a peer, and it's not coming from mom or dad. It's usually interest-based. Um, it's actually coming from up here so that's really great um, another really great strategy is at the beginning of the year most states have recommended reading lists at the different grades so you're able to find that usually on the department of education website for the specific grades and then just like you get beginning of the year shoes maybe you get two or three books at the beginning of the year and you can kind of put those in there um, i'm always looking in different different areas for different books just to kind of stick in there but ultimately he'll make the decision based on what he wants to read so i think that level of ownership and independence is crucial Great suggestion about the Department of Education for a resource. Thanks, Stephanie. Tisha, you shared great examples for children and how they learn through play. Do you have other ideas on how to use items around the home to provide play that's engaging for preschoolers? Most definitely. I'm a huge advocate for free play. Um, one idea is make musical instruments out of a paper towel, toilet paper holders, plastic cups, dishes, pots, pans, rubber bands. Another example is get a flashlight and ask your child to shine the light on something that starts with A or the sound K. This is just something um, to build on what you have maybe been working on. Um, have them shine the flashlight on three different objects that start with A. Um, if you have a large box or pillows and blankets, have them make a fort and have them leave the fort and go find something that starts with the letter C and bring it back to the fort. Um, I remember building a fort with my brother when I was little. That is so fun. So that's something that they can keep up after. Measuring cups, uh, box of rice, beans, practice measuring and dumping and pouring. If it's hot, set up a sprinkler, kick a ball, throw a ball. Um, set up a store in your home. So take some of your child's toys, put price tags on them, get some fake money, and practice buying the toys back and forth and counting money and change. Um, all of those things allow them to have imagination and practice skills that they're actually learning, not only in school, but at home also. All wonderful ideas. Tisha and the early childhood team have put some links on the resource page. So for those of you that want to follow up on some of these great ideas they've shared, uh, you can go there and visit some of the resources that are provided by the ECE team. Tony, I think it's back to you for closing us out. Thanks, Denise. Sorry, I was busy writing down all of these great ideas. Uh, what a great amount of information that we have uh, received today. So I really want to thank our panelists. I want to thank all of uh, those of you who are uh, taking the time to attend. We really hope that uh, you're able to take some strategies and use them immediately. 
And so with that, I'm going to uh, sign us off, but uh, make sure that you register for next uh, Wednesday's webinar, Scrolling and Eye Rolling, Promoting uh, Teen Student Success and Online Learning. So with that, uh, thank you, and we'll see you next week.